the art of bushcraft is about living outdoors, relying upon our understanding and our knowledge of the natural world which surrounds us. In this program, I've come to the jungle, which isn't always an easy place to travel in, but one where good bushcraft really makes the difference. No matter how many times I return to the jungle, I always forget just how awe-inspiring it is. I love forests of all kinds, and the scale of the jungle is second to none. Of all the jungles, this is the one to visit. The Amazon. This is Venezuela. There are places down there no one has ever set foot. And that's one of the great things about bushcraft, the ability to do without all the clutter of everyday life. One of the frustrating things about this forest is that even in an aircraft, you only get a small view of it. It's so huge. The only way to really understand how big it is is to have a look at a map. The Amazon covers almost 3 million square miles. That's bigger than Australia. I'm flying to an airstrip at a remote village called Canaracuni, near the Brazilian border. It's 200 miles from the nearest town, but my final destination is even further, deep in the forest, the best way to experience the jungle. It's the knowledge of bushcraft that invites us to step out into this huge canvas and leave our world behind. The people of Kanarakuni are called the Yekwana, one of the oldest and proudest tribes of the area. Even with an airstrip, they don't get many visitors out here so our cameras were a great source of interest. My plan is to camp near the village so I can enjoy being in the jungle but still learn from the living bushcraft of the Equana. If there's one thing I've learned from embarking on a trip like this, it's that whatever your plans and wherever you are, stay flexible, because this far from home, nothing ever goes quite according to plan. Well, the uh, plans, as they often do when you travel in these sorts of areas, have got a little bit awry. Got here a bit later than expected. Had hoped to get into the rainforest today, but that'll have to wait till tomorrow. So tonight, myself and the crew, we're going to be in this house that's set aside here for visitors and uh, make ourselves pretty comfortable. But it looks great. Amazing building. First job, get the hammock set up and uh, settle in a little bit. After two days travelling, it was lovely to receive such a warm welcome. Nice to you. <laughs> Early next day, we set off down river. Three men from the village came with us, Luis, Saul and Benito. For them, bushcraft is a way of life.
This is brilliant. This is where my journey really begins. As we leave the village and come down this river, we're entering one of the most pristine environments on the planet. When you travel in an environment like this, with these sorts of people, you're really stepping back in time. But the technology is no less sophisticated than our own. It's just different. A little further down river was a sobering reminder of what can happen when things go wrong out here. Brace yourselves. You right? I can't believe it. Right in the middle of the river, there's a crashed aircraft. Can you imagine what a bad day this pilot had? Not only did he crash, he crashed in the middle of some rapids. And it's a very long walk back to civilization from here. I learnt later that they'd crashed because they overshot the runway at Kanarakuni after drinking too much. Lucky for them, they all survived. What we're looking for is a place to set up camp. Ideally, I want a, a shelving shoreline with a place we can bring the canoe in, perhaps a little beach where we can wash. As we rounded a bend, we came across the perfect spot, home for the next week or so. This is the flood area. When the river floods, this bit of ground gets washed. And because of that, there's less vegetation here, there are less nooks and crannies for creepy crawlies, things that might bite us, to hide. The other advantage of being on ground that gets flooded is anything that we do here, any cutting we do, any fires we light, will get cleaned up by nature herself, which pleases me. Even though this is a massive forest, I still like to minimise the impact that I have on it while I'm here. So the first thing to do is get my hammock up, my tarp up, and really start to make this home. My equipment is man-made, but one of the principles of bushcraft is to know where and how to find the natural equivalents. Luis, one of the village elders, and Saul, we're happy to show how they sleep when they're away from the village. I'm setting up quite a, an elaborate lightweight camp because I'm going to be here a few days. If I was just here overnight, I wouldn't go to all these lengths. And the first job normally is that the roof goes up because if it's pouring with rain, we can then work completely freely in the dry beneath it. And that's very important because when it's raining very hard, it's very difficult to think straight. The rain pounding on your head makes you make poor decisions and accidents are frequent in those circumstances. little tip, never put your hands into an area that you can't see into with your eyes. You just never know. That way you don't get embarrassed and neither does a snake. Always gingerly test the knots. Well, that's great. I'm happy now because I've got my roof up, I've got my bed for the night, feels really good. Now, I, everything I do now just basically improves my condition here. The fundamental things I've put up. Sometimes you can be lulled into a false sense of security, like now it's not raining. 
So you might think, oh, it's going to be a nice day. I'll just be a bit sloppy in the way I put my camp up. I guarantee if you do that, two o'clock in the morning, the most horrendous downpour will show all of your faults. Their hammock really was that simple, just strips of bark. Not that Saul seemed concerned, he was a real showman. Saul's gone to sleep. <laughs> this is the way we do things. When we travel in the forest, we can take our big hammocks from home. It's very important for us because we have to hunt and fish, and for that we have to go into the forest for many days. We can't buy food in the forest, and we've no cattle ranches. We have to hunt, and for that we need a hammock to sleep in. much as it's nice to be in a village, I can't help thinking it's much better to be here in the forest. I love it. Here I can really take care of myself. The temperature is warm, it's sticky, but somehow it feels right. You feel just so much alive. And all around me, there's life. In the gloom last night, I was collecting a bit of firewood and I saw this, what looked like a palm tree. I thought I'd just chop that out of the way. Had a bash, only to discover it was a piece of aluminium aircraft fuselage from that crashed plane just up the river there. Made a dink out of my parang with that. I'm not too happy about it. A machete is the most important tool in the forest and yesterday I heard a story that really illustrates that. There's a story of Yaquana people travelling down this river when their canoe was about to turn over in some rapids and there was this terrible momentary pause when one of the men had to make the decision. Does he take his pack with all his food and his cooking equipment or does he take his machete? Well of course the choice was obvious and he took the machete because with that and what he knows about the forest he can find life here. This is a very important tool here, but it's also worth bearing in mind that the machete or the parang is the most dangerous tool we use in bushcraft because the length of the edge is so great. There's tremendous potential to bite us. And there are a few things we have to know. The first is we need to keep it sharp. So every day on a daily basis, you sharpen it. For that, I carry with me a small sharpening stone, combination stone like this. But if I didn't have that, I could use a pebble from the river. Probably the best way to show you how to use a machete is to make something. And we need a bench to go in our camp there so we can sit comfortably by the fire in the evening. And that's what I'm going to make. To start with, I've cut a small stick to give me a measure for some of the pieces I'm going to need. And I need to cut some strong supports. And I use a measuring rod and we just put a mark on there. That's where I want to cut it. I'm going to need a point on the end. So rather than cut through and then point it, we'll do it all in one go. And this is something that you can really only do with a strong, stiff machete. It's to cut like so. All ready to go. Perfect. So that's one. Rainforest saplings are fabulous building materials. They're straight and strong. And when you need rope, you just split a liana or two.
For the bench as long as this, you need to put an extra support in the middle. Now, we lock it off. That gives a lot more support. What I'll do is I'll lash this on here. Everything locks together solid. Now we can sit comfortably and enjoy the fire. Having somewhere to sit down makes life a lot more comfortable in any environment, but particularly in this one with all the termites and ants crawling around on the forest floor. With my camp well established, I was ready to take a better look at Kanarakuni and find out more about where Luis, Saul and Benito came from. These villages are like islands in the Pacific. That's how cut off they are from modern life, though there were bizarre reminders everywhere of the world outside of the forest. About 120 people live here. Most of what they do is subsistence living, but they're also known for their baskets, which they trade. Primero se hace esta este color blanco, ¿no? Everything we use comes from the rainforest. The basic material for the baskets comes from a vine. The pigment comes from a palm tree, which looks very like a banana tree. Some of the drawings on the basket are purely ornamental, but some of them have mythological meanings. According to ancient tales, there was a god on earth who kept birds. He sent the birds into the sky with a long string and some glue to drag the stars from the earth into the sky. And that's how the stars came to be in heaven. Bushcraft encompasses many skills and crafts. The huge communal building in Kanarakuni is an impressive piece of collaborative construction. Great proof of the power and skills that bushcraft encompasses. I'd already seen how Luis and Saul work together. To build this, the whole village must have helped. Life in Kanarakuni is a mixture of change and tradition. They still paint themselves for special occasions. This bakery provides the staple food, a dried bread made from manioc root. We think we are close now to being owners of our own land. This means we'll have more power to defend our rights. We've seen other communities that weren't so lucky. They lost their culture and they were thrown out of their land in some cases. We don't want that to happen to us. We want to continue our traditions and culture. So we'll mix in a little of some of the new ideas. But we'll do it slowly and we'll decide for ourselves what we want and what we don't want. But the modern world is steadily encroaching and they are aware that they must be strong to deal with it. I was touched by their generosity. It's beautiful wood. Muy bonito madera. Mm -hmm. 
There's no point trying to live by the rules and schedules of normal life when you're in the jungle. The jungle is beautiful but harsh, so you have to give yourself enough rest, liquids and time to wash. Not that there isn't time to enjoy yourself too. Though the jungle is just as capable of giving you a dousing. At the end of each day, is a nice little part of the routine, which is the wash and then into your dry kit. You keep one set of clothes dry for the evenings, well, as dry as you can make them. And it's important, when your feet have been wet all day, to wash them, to powder them, and to rub some life back into them. This prevents foot problems, foot rot, and other conditions associated with that. Really good. It's a nice time. It's not very often you take so much time to pamper yourself, as it were. It's great having the old hammock though, because you can just sit here. It's raining outside and the rain can't touch you, it's brilliant. Nice moment. There's absolutely no point in trying to stay dry in a rainforest. Things are just far too wet. But at the end of the day, it's really worthwhile putting on your dry clothes and these waterproof socks, well, right now my feet are already warm and toasty. Fantastic. Ugh. This is our logistics camp. Doesn't matter how many times you come to the rainforest, you rarely see the same thing done twice. The way they've set up this shelter is really interesting. They'd taken flexible boughs and chosen to arch the roof of our camp kitchen. So simple, yet unique in my experience. We brought much of our food with us, it's a full-time job for the people of Kanarakuni to feed themselves, but we did buy pineapples from them, the best I'd ever tasted. So why is this tree important to you, Lewis? Because it's important for us to make a pelota. We use it to make balls to play. And how do you do that? You take the latex out of the tree. To get a big ball, you need to cut more than one tree in order to collect enough latex. And is that how these cuts came to be made? Yo. I did it. You did it? How many years ago was that? 40 years ago. Wow. Must have been small. Yes, I remember it well. And I remember each tree we used to use. I tell the children now where they can't find the right trees to make balls because balls from the city are expensive.
Ahora solo. Talking to Luis was like having her own encyclopedia of the jungle, and he was wonderfully generous with his knowledge. What's this then, Luis? It's red sap from a vine that we use as a dye. Traditionally, it should only be collected by women who are no longer virgins. It's believed young girls coming of age might bleed to death if they do it. So it's gathered by older women who already have children and grandmothers. It's a really intense red color. It really looks like this is bleeding. You can easily understand the mythology associated with it. If I put my hands down, you might think I'd cut myself. Very strong colour. Almost everything comes from the forest, including their fishing rods. Luis used the fire to harden the rod, a technique I've seen indigenous people use all around the world. Where I come from, people will often spend a whole week's wages to buy a fishing rod. The other thing that happens, Lewis, is that they catch fish and then they throw them back into the river once they've caught them. What do you think of that? <laughs> So they're throwing the money out of the window <laughs> and they probably go to a shop and buy the fish anyway. <laughs> Next, Next morning, we had to empty the boats before an early start. We're going fishing today, and like, as always in these events, it's a whole family affair, like a real party outing. Great way to go and get your food. Some of our visitors are getting a sightseeing tour of our camp as we go past. It's like being on a double-decker London bus. <laughs> it feels like one of those explorer goes down the river moments. Pull hard together, blade on a feather. Reminds me of my boating days. So I've gone, man. <laughs> Travelling down a river is a great way to see anywhere. I, mean, I love river journeys, point blank. Somehow, when you're on a river, you're on the very life of the forest itself. And uh, it's hard to remember just how remote this is. We are so remote here, it's, it's just hard to picture. In the distance, the Seren Seren Yama, just above the mist there. Awesome. You hear the birds singing, so peaceful. When you come places like this, you realise what noise pollution is.
One of the real benefits of coming away from the disturbance of the camp is that for the first time you really start to see the life of the forest. Almost everywhere I look there's something going on, like these toads mating. You can see the eggs coming out there from the female, being fertilised by the much smaller male on her back. The more time I spent with these people, the more I enjoyed their company. To catch the fish, we needed poison from the roots of a barbasco vine. It takes a bit of effort to get at it. Barbasco contains a mild poison that temporarily blocks the oxygen in the water so that fish are forced to the surface. They may have been small, but out here every morsel counts and they were certainly enough for a picnic. And what a place for a picnic. That evening, I was struck by how everything here is about working together. Not just the people, but the forest too. The Iquana know that as long as they look after the forest, it will look after them. One of the real joys of the rainforest is the amount of life that's here. But this morning that life has come just a little bit too close. Termites have taken a liking to the crew's equipment boxes as potential new homes. It means very simple arrangement, everything has to be clipped up off the ground. You can't camp in the forest without addressing sanitation. And I had visitors arriving that evening, so it was time to dig another loo. A pit two foot by four foot is enough for four people for a couple of days. Breaking up the sandy soil provides a covering to prevent flies and reduce the smell.
and the candle, that's for the night, just to check no snakes have fallen in. I always take a medical kit with me, but the forest provides its own medicines for the people who live here. This is the way our ancestors healed themselves from flu. This is a plant that's very important to us. We use this sap when someone's bitten by a snake, ant, spider or any venomous animal. You drink this sap and are healed. That's why it's important for us to look after this plant. My visitors were a good incentive to do a bit of washing. It's not just hygiene, it's also good for morale. Believe me, after a few days the smell gets rather overpowering, whoever you're with. Anyway, it doesn't take long for clothes to dry in weather like this. My guests were all leaders in their own fields, and I was thrilled that they could come to help us learn more about our surroundings. I'm Ray. You're Ray. You're Lindy. I'm the leading. Joel. Joel. Yeah. Jesus. 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 Nice to meet you, man. Yeah, yeah, Ray. Ray. Good to meet you. Joel. Joel. Yeah. Joel. Hi. Nice it's been a hi, hi, hi. Yeah, that's good to make it here. It's incredible pleasure. Just amazing. Well, let's you're help like, you with your nice gear. And, yeah. and uh, we'll show you where you're staying. I thought it would be nice if you told me a little bit about yourselves. I am a hardcore naturalist. I have been always interested in the animals in the wild, in the forest. Uh, even the naturalists tend to be disappearing. I wholeheartedly believe that we need to be out there looking for animals, learning from them. The animals that I have been studying the most are reptiles and amphibians. And this area is actually a paradise for those. Um, I'm interested in trees of all kinds, and I'm especially interested in the world of the treetops, of the canopy. Um, when I first came to a rainforest when I was a graduate student in Costa Rica, uh, my eyes went right up to the canopy and said, what is going on up there? And it turns out very little is known about the canopy. I became so thoroughly inspired by being in the treetops that I, I couldn't let it go. You know, it's a, it's a place that uh, most people don't ever see. And it grabs you as soon as you're there. It's hard to come down. The next morning, I was to get my chance to experience at first hand what Joel had talked about. Exciting. All the rainforests I've been to, I've never had the opportunity to do what we're about to do today. And uh, it's very frustrating when you're in the forest, if you like trees and you like forests, if you can't see out and actually see what they look like. So uh, not only will I get a chance to see from above, like you get when you're in a plane, but also be close to it, not remote. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Right through here. This is the moment I've been waiting for. You look small down there already. It's great coming up because all the way up there are different levels, different sizes of trees. It's tremendous to be able to look down and see it from the sort of tree's perspective. Well, 
this is stunning. I can't believe it. I really can't believe it. I've been to rainforests literally all over the world and I've never had the opportunity to see this. This is staggering. I'm quite, I'm quite um, taken aback by it all, really. Amazing. When you fly in over a forest, you're hundreds of feet above it. And to start with, you know, when you start high, you look down and you see moss. And then as your plane starts to come in lower, you see broccoli. And then you see trees and you see sometimes fruits and parrots and monkeys and occasionally an Indian and a kuna on the river. But that's it. Here I can reach it, I can touch it. That is just amazing. Absolutely amazing. I can't tell you, you know, you spent months and months on the ground and you've never seen where the real life of this ecosystem is. It's gobsmacking to come up here. It's awesome. So how does it work, Nelly? Can you tell me how it all works? Well, this is really, I mean, it sort of depends on where you want to start. This upper canopy is really where probably about 90% of the energy is captured by these leaves. Yep. And by photosynthesis, since they get this direct sunlight, as you go down, you'll see that it gradually gets darker and darker. And so as you get down to the forest floor, you've only got about 2% of the sunlight left. So all the plants on the forest floor are very well adapted to very, very dark conditions. But, but these trees have really had to fight to get up here, haven't they? That's right. They? Basically, it's been sort of a, this game of competition that when seedlings start on the ground, some of them require gaps. Sometimes they can just wait it out, wait for a tree fall, and then they're boom, ready to go. And they just start growing vertically without branches no, because they're investing all. all of their energy to into just getting up. Once they get up, though, you can see the architecture of these trees are spreading out their crowns now that they're up here yeah. to maximize the interception and capture of, of energy. Yeah. What are the discoveries you've made so far? Well, part of uh, what I've been working on is trying to understand how what goes on in the canopy relates to the forest as a whole. How nutrients that are yeah. captured by ferns and bromeliads and these plants that grow up here, how they return to the whole forest. And yeah. it turns out they're actually very important in terms of bringing in more nutrients by So the, these presence. are the plants that actually uh, sort of live on the major trees. That's right. Yep. And they okay. don't get their nutrients from the ground. Yep or the tree. They get them from the rainfall and the mist and the, and they, the dust that comes in. So what they can trap. Exactly. Yeah. And once they trap that and grow on it, when they die and fall down to the forest floor, of course those nutrients start joining the dance of the nutrient cycling of yeah. the forest as a whole. Yeah. So they sort of serve as nutrient sponges for the forest. Many, many plants, many insects, you never see them on the forest floor. And so part of the work of my students and my colleagues and I has, have been simply to categorize and collect the plants that grow up here. I wish everybody could see this. I do too. I do too. Right, for me, you filled in a piece that was missing from the I'm jigsaw. so delighted that we got it's to bring you special. up here, Ray. Very special. That's fantastic. That is an adventure. And coming down, you have a chance to look a little bit more easily than when you're processing up. And you see all these different layers of saplings fighting to get up there. It's wonderful. Really wonderful. And now we are down in the gloom. This is rather like being a, a mouse under the table where there's a party. The party's up there and it's just the scraps down here and the scavengers cleaning up. Jesus Rivas is one of Venezuela's best known scientists. So it was a real treat for me to explore our immediate surroundings with him for his unique perspective on the local animals. I wasn't disappointed. This is a dead frog. It's a live frog. <laughs> this is plain dead now. So that's his defense mechanism, is it? Has yeah, then many predators don't get interest in dead animals. They just want to make sure it's very fresh and live. <laughs> Any chance he has, he will come back to life. Yeah, there oh, we go. He's back to life. Should get an Oscar. <laughs> oh, yeah. What a performer. <laughs> that... Life. <laughs> there are lots of frogs in South America. You have uh, two-thirds of the frogs, of the total number of species of the world, you find them in South America only. 
You know, a lot of people are afraid of going into the forest because of the very things you like to study. Because they don't know any better. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I've always had this view that knowledge dispels fear. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know. It's, uh, I think some sort of therapos, I think. Oh. It doesn't like to stand in my hand. Uh, it's uh, some sort of tarantula, as far as I can tell, but uh, I don't know this species, it might be a new species for all that we know. More first water shrimp. He think he's a lobster. So this is a total beauty. It's a poison dart frog. So this is what's interesting. This area has never been sampled. Animals from this area are not known in any museum or any collection. So finding these guys here is actually pretty cool because we can figure out where they come from and uh, what the origin is. They're called poison dart frog because they they have a they're pretty really very very poisonous. Their their skin has to toxins that if any predator eats them they'll die. So what indigenous people do in some parts, they uh, poison their darts in the skin of these frogs. And so when they kill, they hit a prey, the prey dies almost instantly for the venom of these guys. However, that venom is only active in the blood system. It's not going to do any harm to my skin. That's why I can handle it without any harm. If I had any wound, any cut in my hands, then I would be in a lot of pain. You get a bad flavor. This is not bad. Sometimes they need to be really harassed to release the, the toxin. Yeah, not good. Benito demonstrated his skill with a machete to knock up a paddle for a canoe. He told me that if you can't make a paddle, you're not a Yekwana. I heard several translations of what Yekwana means, but the one that rang most true was the people who come by boat. The river is truly in their blood. It's their highway, it provides their food, and it's a playground. I've rarely seen anyone more at home on the water. I couldn't walk more than a dozen paces without Luis, Saul or Benito showing me another plant that they used. This is Mahewa. We call it Mahewa. It's used when you have a bite or little wound from a sharp tool. 
It helps to heal the wound. By the final morning of our stay here, our camp was being co-opted back into nature. I felt right at home and very sad to have to go. But there was one last thing I wanted to know if I could see before leaving. Their knowledge of how to light a fire. I asked them to show me their traditional method of fire lighting but it soon became apparent that matches and cigarette lighters had replaced traditional knowledge. Let's have a go then, Benito. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh... Oh. Broken it. I thought it. You stick it in a longer stick. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah, it's under here. Would it be right if I suggest a slightly different way of doing this? Because <laughs> I think we can make fire with your sticks. Como, como ahorita. Sí. 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 Yeah. Sí, como, como nosotros, como estamos ahora, no, nosotros no lo vimos tampoco en nuestra obra, no. Haven't seen how to make fire. No, that's cool. I understand. Sí, that. I understand. They have heard about it, but they never see it. it my, my normal work is teaching these skills, and it would be a privilege if I could actually show you what I know of this technique. I need their help though, because I need a good stick to push this into. Fire lighting by friction is a very difficult skill. For a man here um, to admit that he can't make fire in the forest, when he can do everything else, that takes a real sense of courage, I think. It's a, it's a, it's a real testament to the strength of character of these people. And um, it's very difficult for me to broach that issue without... It's very difficult for me to broach that issue without questioning his manhood. And we've been able to get past that stage and hopefully we'll make some fire here today and we'll put that skill back. What I'm going to show them is the way I make fire. And it may be that this is slightly different to their cultural way of making fire. But I think at the end of the day, what is important is the ability to go into the forest and find fire from what nature provides. Because this drill is a little bit too short, what we're going to do is we're going to attempt to lengthen it with another stick which needn't be dry. That looks great, it looks good. This was uncertain ground, both for me and them. Benita, how far do you have to go to get matches or a lighter? In this area is very far away for anything and it takes a long time. How long? One to ten. It can take from 15 days to even one month if you go in a canoe and paddling. 15 days to a month paddling in a canoe to yeah. get a box of matches. It kind of tells a story, doesn't it? Uh, if you can just hold that for me for a moment. When I drill, a powder will collect and that will eventually start to glow. Okay. There's our ember. In a rainforest like this, you have to have the materials prepared, really, for this sort of fire lighting. And in the past, people would have kept these materials nice and dry, ready for their need. And we haven't got those materials to hand, so I'm uh, robbing the BBC's medical kit and um, helping myself to some cotton wool, 
which we'll use as tinder. But there are trees in the rainforest that provide seeds at the right time of year, which are just like that. Harder. One of the things about the rainforest, it's so humid today that this isn't catching fire straight away. It's not the ideal tinder, but we have got fire now. We'll add some little shavings on there and away it'll go. Hello. <laughs> Some years ago we worked on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and the people there still keep these skills alive because like you they're a long way from, from sort of the outside world. There was a, a wonderful woman there who said that when you can make fire by friction you carry your fire in your mind and in your muscles. <coughs> oh dear, don't smoke that stuff. Oh. <laughs> hey! Well done, Benito. <laughs> Fantastic. The wood they're about to put on the fire is a tree that they taught me about. I had no idea about this. And this, this wood here burns even when it's green. And it's one of the things that they have to know about making fire in the forest. Their ancestors may have had to rub sticks to make fire. Today they use lighters. But some knowledge still survives. Our success inspired Saul and the others to practice frantically all the next day. so they could pass their rediscovered knowledge on to the next generation.